Well, thank you. It's my privilege to be here with you this morning. Um, first speaker of the morning, opening things up. And that was a short introduction, uh, and I'm sure many of you don't know who I am, so I should spend a moment talking about that. I am a husband and a father. Uh, my children are two sons. This is my younger son, Thaddeus, who just turned 18 last week, actually. Uh, I wasn't ready for him to turn 18, and I told him that. I asked if he could hold off for a while, but he went ahead and did that anyway, so that was rather inconsiderate, I thought. And then my older son, Sean, uh, got married last summer to our new daughter-in-law. That's my wife over there on the right, of course. And so my wife and I are now eagerly anticipating and hoping for grandchildren. Uh, in fact, my wife is perhaps more eager about that than I am. I've noticed that lately when she thinks no one is watching, she's walking around rubbing her hands together and cackling. So, <laughs> but none of that answers the question that I'm assuming most of you have, is like, who let me into a place like this? Um, what is going on here? I mean, this conference, uh, I've noticed, has a lot of information about end times. And here I am to talk about the beginning of time, sort of the opposite of that. Well, this is actually quite relevant. I'm a former atheist and evolutionist. And as Ron mentioned, uh, I was an engineer in actually the military side of the space program. And I went into that position as an atheist and an evolutionist. And I was an atheist because I was an evolutionist. I've been a science nerd since I was about this tall. And I still am, because once a geek, always a geek, right? And I have been taught and all of, from all of my secular humanist heroes, like Isaac Asimov and Carl Sagan and all the rest of them, that science disproved God. It disproved the Bible. It disproved the creation account. Science showed how we all got here without a creator. So why would you want to believe in one anyway? It's not only unnecessary, it's undesirable. It's a bad explanation. And it wasn't until well into my adult years working in that position that I had that I was confronted with evidence against my atheism and evolutionism. And eventually, after spending basically a year trying to disprove all that, I eventually became a creationist and then a Christian. And it happened in that order. And I like to mention that when I speak because I think that's important. The other side in the creation-evolution debate, the side that I used to be on, often likes to portray our side as being, uh, believing in creation because we have to. Because we have this commitment to the Bible as being God's word, as being true, that forces us to affirm that creation happened and forces us to deny all this obvious evidence from science for the millions of years, the neo-Darwinian processes, and all the rest of it. Uh, and they claim that if we could somehow take off the blinders that our faith puts on us, then we would be able to see all this evidence objectively and see things their way and affirm that evolution, etc., is true. Well, I'm one of many for whom the opposite is the case. I became persuaded by the evidence first that creation was true, and then that opened the door to me becoming a Christian afterward. Uh, I also want to say believing in creation is not sufficient to make one a Christian, obviously, right? Because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. I mean, there are Muslims who affirm creation. Uh, but there are many for whom the evolution issue is a stumbling block. It's preventing them from seriously considering the claims of the Bible and the gospel message. And so I think that's why this is an important subject. So our topic specifically here this morning, as you can see, is the universe. Where did the universe itself come from? Our culture tells us that there was this Big Bang event quite some time ago that explains where everything came from and how we all got here. Well, that's not the only possible interpretation. Of course, there's two basic interpretations of the cosmos. And that's, it was either created or it wasn't. It had a creator or it does not. So two basic interpretations, creation or not creation. Did the, the cosmos create itself? Well, Genesis tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And hopefully that's a familiar verse to us. But we are told that this is not a legitimate explanation. This is an illegitimate account of origins. Why is that? Because it is a supernatural explanation. And the prefix super just means that which is above or beyond. So that which is supernatural is that which is above or beyond the natural world. Now we were told that only naturalism is an appropriate and allowable worldview when it comes to discussing origins. The idea that only natural processes can be invoked. That only the world we see around us uh, and the processes therein are allowed as explanations. So the most popular naturalistic explanation for the universe today is the Big Bang model. So in the beginning, there was this Big Bang event. The Big Bang made some energy, which cooled into matter, which condensed into gas. That gas then gathered itself together into stars. Those stars then gathered themselves together into galaxies. One of those galaxies is the Milky Way galaxy. 
of course, where we are. Within the Milky Way galaxy, supposedly, about four and a half billion years ago, this cloud of gas began to condense under gravity and form some planets, one of which is the planet Earth where we are today looking at it all. Now, of course, both sides in this debate agree that we are indeed on the Earth looking at it all, but what about the rest of this timeline? How well does the rest of this uh, alleged history withstand scrutiny? Well, we could actually walk through every step in this process and show that it doesn't really work. For example, if we uh, talk about the solar system, well, what we're told is our solar system came from this cloud of gas and dust. Four and a half billion years ago, this cloud began to condense and collapse under gravity and started to swirl around. As it did so, from the gas, dust formed. Then the dust started to stick together into little clumps, which stuck together to become rocks, which stuck together to become bigger rocks, which stuck together to uh, become what are called planetesimals, which means little planets, basically asteroids, and then those formed the, the planets that we see today in various ways. Now, if you go to a planetarium show or read a science textbook or the Cosmos TV program or whatever it may be, you'll be told that this is good science. We know this is how it all happened. Minor detail that they leave out, though, is that this model doesn't actually work. Why is that? Well, let's say for a moment you can get dust from the gas. There's actually some problems with that, but let's give them that for the moment. Now, once you have dust, it'll stick together, right? Just look under your furniture for proof of that. <laughs> and then the clumps will stick together to make little rocks, but once the rocks get to be about this big, one meter or a little bit less, the building process, the accretion process, stops. Why is that? Well, at this big, the rocks start having enough mass to be destructive when they collide. I mean, what happens if you take rocks this big and smash them together at hundreds or thousands of miles an hour? Do you get bigger rocks out of that process? No, you get rubble. So at this point, they're massive enough to be destructive. They're not yet massive enough to have enough gravity to pull the rubble together afterward to make bigger things. So the building process stops right here. Obviously, this is a little bit shy of a planet, right? Are secular scientists aware of this? Well, yes, they are. Here's a quote from one of my astrophysics textbooks. Once these planetesimals, these asteroids, have been formed, further growth of planets may occur through their gravitational accretion, their gathering together into large bodies, but just how that takes place is not understood. This author says, the formation of planetesimals, the kilometer-sized planetary precursors, is still a puzzling process. This author says, how the first stage of this process, primary accretion, works is a fundamental unsolved problem of planetary science. Now, for those of you who are interested in science, who heard about this problem in the last planetarium show that you went to? Or did you hear this discussed on the Cosmos TV program or a science magazine or whatever? Is this how um, this part of history is portrayed? Does, does the public hear about these sorts of problems? Well, no, they don't somehow. Although, obviously, secular scientists are aware of them. I mean, I'm quoting them here, right? What's their explanation for it? Well, here's their explanation. Let's see if you think this makes sense. Objects must have grown very rapidly from sub-meter-sized pebbles, remember, this big or so, into 100-kilometer-sized bodies, possibly in a single leap. <laughs> so rocks this big turned into asteroids the size of Rhode Island. Is that a scientific model? Or is that a story, well, that must have happened somehow because we're here, aren't we? Who's ever heard that logical fallacy being used? So we could actually stop our discussion of the solar system right here because the secular modeler does not have the building blocks he needs to make anything in the solar system other than some rubble. Now, I actually have a full presentation just on the solar system, and it's mostly outside of the scope of what we're going to talk about here this morning. But we could actually go planet by planet through the solar system. In addition to this building block issue, each planet actually discredits the secular model in unique ways on its own. So that's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm, I can't resist though, talking just a couple of minutes about some of the gas giant planets here. For example, Jupiter is the largest of the planets in the solar system, sometimes called the king of the planets, right? It's famous, of course, for its giant red spot, this large storm system that's been on the planet for as long as we've had telescopes uh, to observe it. This one storm system alone is bigger than the planet Earth. So imagine how violent that would be. Now, to make a planet this big in your model, you need a lot of stuff, don't you? Well, we've already seen that the secular model doesn't have the building blocks he needs. For example, this author says, how this process, this planet building process, continues from meter-sized boulders to kilometer-scale planetesimals is a major unsolved problem. Boulders are expected to stick together poorly. That's what I already told you about. Now, here's a second problem I didn't tell you about yet. And to spiral into the protostar in a few hundred orbits owing to a headwind from the slower rotating gas. Remember, these rocks are, are trying to build themselves in a cloud of gas that they're orbiting within. Well, as they're plowing into the gas, that slows them down. It's like a headwind in a sense. 
And the way orbits work is when you slow down, you move toward the thing you're orbiting. Turns out that even if these rocks could build bigger than about one meter in size, it still doesn't get you off the hook here if you're trying to build a secular model of origins because they would spiral all the way into the protostar, i.e. the sun that's trying to form in the middle of this cloud of gas. So in other words, the rocks, even if they could build larger than this, wouldn't have time to do so anyway because they're going to spiral all the way in and crash into the sun. How long does that take? Just a few hundred orbits, a matter of hundreds of years, not the millions of years that the secular modelers want them to be available. As this author says, the problem with this tidy little theory is that when the burgeoning space rocks grew to about one meter in size, orbital mechanics tells us the gas commingling with them in the protoplanetary disk should have acted like a brake, slowing their velocity appreciably. Their orbital speed having been cut, these filing cabinet-sized space rocks would have spiraled into the sun. So building a planet like Jupiter in the secular model, you don't have anything to work with, no building blocks. And oh, by the way, it turns out that Jupiter has some important chemical compositional differences between what we see in the planet and what the model predicts the building blocks would have had anyway. So if you ask where did Jupiter come from, you might see quotes like this one. Jupiter is the largest of all the planets, but results published in Nature, the scientific journal by that name, now reveal the embarrassing fact that we know next to nothing about how or where it formed. And as this author said, I don't think the existence of Jupiter would be predicted if it weren't observed. <laughs> Jupiter has other problems for the secular model also. Let's say you could make rocks bigger than this, and let's say you somehow could keep them around long enough to make a planet. That still doesn't get you off the hook if you're trying to build a secular origins model. Why is that? Well, once planets are built, they're not, they don't suddenly become immune to the laws of physics. Even once Jupiter formed, it too would still be plowing through the gas, this headwind in effect, and it turns out this would actually bring Jupiter, even as a planet, all the way into the sun. This is called the migration problem. Jupiter will migrate all the way into the sun early in the solar system's history, according to this model. As this press release from Astronomy and Astrophysics points out, theories predict that the giant protoplanets, meaning the planets that are trying to form, will merge into the central star. It's a nice way of saying crash into the sun before planets have time to form. This makes it very difficult to understand how they can form at all. Understanding the formation of giant planets is currently one of the major challenges for astronomers. Well, it's more than a major challenge. The model says the planet shouldn't be there, but there it is. There's more we could say about Jupiter if we had the time to do so, but for this morning, let's move on and talk briefly about Saturn. Saturn, of course, is famous for its beautiful rings, and there's actually a lot we could talk about just here. But as a planet, Saturn too, it turns out, suffers from the migration problem. So Saturn too, along with Jupiter, shouldn't actually be there. Saturn has dozens of moons also, and let's talk about two of them just briefly, because these are kind of fun. This is Enceladus. Enceladus is a pretty little moon, as you can see. It's a very bright object. It reflects back into space almost all the light from the sun that it receives. Now, our first photographs of Enceladus were kind of intriguing. Uh, this photograph here, that Saturn's rings going through the middle, and the spacecraft was almost edge on at the time, which is why they looked that way. Notice there's Enceladus below, and hopefully you can see, it's dark enough in here, you can see that little smudge below Enceladus on this photograph. Photographs like this were, were intriguing. It's like, well, what's going on here? Let's go take a closer look. Turns out Enceladus has water geysers coming out of its south pole, fountains of water and ice. Now, this is interesting because Enceladus is not a large object. It's very small. That means that if it were actually billions of years old, it would have cooled off from its formation long ago. Therefore, it should not have any geological energy left within it. Therefore, it should not be geologically active anymore. But it is geologically active. This false color picture shows you how big some of these geysers are. Now, if, if Enceladus were only thousands of years old, this isn't a problem. Enceladus is could still be cooling off after its creation a few thousands of years ago. It could still be geologically active today. So thousands of years old, this isn't a problem. Billions of years old, this is a problem. Now, if you look up uh, about Enceladus in secular sources, you'll be told that Enceladus is receiving tidal energy from Saturn and its surrounding moons. Basically, Enceladus is caught in a gravitational tug of war. Saturn's pulling it one way, some of the neighboring moons are pulling it the other way, so it's being squeezed and flexed. Now that's true, that is happening, but that only provides a few percent of the necessary geological energy to do this. So secular modelers have no explanation for what's going on here. 
Nor can they explain what's going on on Titan. Titan is Saturn's largest moon, as you can guess by the name. It's actually larger than the planet Mercury. And it's also, as you can see by the photo here, um, fuzzy in appearance because it has an atmosphere. Now, we can't see through the atmosphere from Earth because it's opaque, but we can observe sunlight bouncing off the atmosphere and reflecting back to us. That has allowed us to analyze its, che its chemistry. And it's been known for some time that Titan has a lot of methane in its atmosphere. Why is that important? Because methane is broken down by sunlight. And you can show fairly easily that all the methane would be gone after just 10 million years. Now, 10 million years is a long time, but that's 4.49 billion years short of the alleged age of Titan, four and a half billion. So, second of the modeler said, no problem, here's what's going on. Titan is indeed billions of years old, but it does still indeed have methane in its atmosphere. That means there must be a source of methane on the surface to keep replenishing the atmosphere after all this time. And oh, by the way, that also means there would be four and a half billion years of byproducts of the breakdown process also on the surface. Turns out that would be ethane and some other chemicals. So second the modelers predicted before we got to Titan that we would find a global ocean of methane and ethane about one and a half kilometers deep on Titan's surface to explain this. Then we got there with the spacecraft and sent down a lander, and it turns out we get photographs like this. There's no global ocean. Titan's surface is dry. There's a few lakes of methane toward the North Pole, but that's basically it. Now, if Titan were thousands of years old, this makes perfect sense. There hasn't been enough time for the methane in the atmosphere to be broken down. There hasn't been enough time for lots of byproducts to build up on the surface. So thousands of years old, no problem. Billions of years old, that's a problem, because Titan looks very young. Other issues in the solar system. We could talk uh, for quite some time, actually, about interesting issues with Uranus and Neptune. Uh, but for my time this morning, I'll limit myself to just the fact that, you might not know this, these planets actually don't exist, according to secular models. As this uh, article in Astronomy Magazine says, Psst, astronomers who model the formation of the solar system have kept a dirty little secret. Uranus and Neptune don't exist or at least computer simulations have never explained how planets as big as the two gas giants could form so far from the sun. Basically, the secular model says planets couldn't have formed out there at their part of the solar system. Even with four and a half billion years to work with, they can't account for these planets. You would think this would be a problem. Secular models say these planets aren't there, but they are there. Again, who heard about this in the last planetarium show you went to, or the last science magazine you read, or whatever? As this author says, it's clear that our level of sophistication of studying planet formation is relatively primitive. So far, it's been very difficult for anybody to come up with a scenario that actually produces Uranus and Neptune. Out beyond Uranus and Neptune, we have the former planet named Pluto. <laughs> and Pluto has been lots of fun. Even creationists have been delighted with, with how, um, how cool some of this stuff is. Notice how Pluto has different kinds of terrain on its surface. We have some rough terrain here, and then toward the south, we have this here, smooth, craterless terrain. Now, this is interesting because uh, it raises the question, were there craters on these smooth places previously? Well, it seems reasonable to assume that Pluto had a fairly even distribution of craters at one point, but it no longer has that today. In fact, as you see in this photograph, there's craters in the terrain on the left and then smooth on the right, and in the middle, you can see that some of the craters are partially filled in. It very much looks like Pluto used to have craters in what is now the smooth regions, and then it, a partial resurfacing occurred that filled in a lot of these craters and made a smooth surface in these places. So the surface has been reworked geologically, but how? Well, this is a, another issue having to do with ages. Pluto is a very small object, would have cooled off from its formation billions of years ago if it were actually billions of years old. It can't have any geological energy anymore. It can't even have internal radioactive energy because it's not dense enough. There's not enough material inside it to keep it warm enough significantly. Nor is tidal energy available as an explanation here to secular modelers. So the secular model, based on the billions of years, says Pluto can't be doing this sort of thing. But apparently it is doing this and has done so quite recently. How do we know that? Because these smooth regions don't have any craters in them yet. There hasn't been enough time. In other words, the resurfacing could have happened the week before our spacecraft got there, for all we can tell. It looks very young and fresh. Now, if Pluto were thousands of years old, that's not a problem. Pluto could still be forming off after its creation, could still have the geological 
energy necessary to be doing this. So thousands of years old, not a problem. Billions of years old is, again, a problem. As one of my astrophysics textbooks says, thus far we have seen that we know very little about the development of the solar system. So this part of the secular timeline doesn't work very well. Doesn't work at all, actually. What about other points in this timeline? Well, we could actually spend a whole session just talking about the formation of stars and galaxies. And Jay touched on this briefly yesterday morning, which I was glad to see, because I'm not going to spend any time on it here this morning, other than to note that secular modelers have similar problems here as those we've already seen in the solar system. But I'm going to skip that for now, because this morning I want to spend the rest of my time talking about the biggest question of all. Where did the entire universe come from? Well, of course, if you're familiar at all with secular claims about such things, you'll know that the Big Bang model is presented as fact, that we know this Big Bang happened. Now, here's an attempt by NASA to capture the entire 14 billion year history of the universe in one slide, which is pretty slick, <laughs> if you think about it. Now, the way this works is, uh, the beginning is on the left, and then today is over on the right. So time goes from left to right in this slide. Now, you see at the very beginning of time, there was this quantum fluctuation. We'll talk in here briefly in a moment about what that is. Then immediately, the universe underwent a period of inflation in which it massively expanded in size, and then subsequently it has gotten a bit bigger since then, but we're not going to concern ourselves with that. Let's focus just on the beginning of this. What is the Big Bang and what supposedly happened? Well, in the beginning, there was this quantum fluctuation and the universe leapt into existence. It immediately produced a lot of energy, that's basically what the early universe was, was energy. The energy cooled into matter, the matter condensed into gas, and the gas gathered itself together into all the various things we see today. Now, if you follow science media, museums, and what the rest of it, you'll be told this is very good science, that we know this happened. In fact, we have a lot of evidence for it. Well, what evidence is that? Well, the first thing, if you ask a secular cosmologist about this, they will tell you that we see a lot of red shifts in the cosmos. And in fact, the farther out we look, the more red shifted things become. Now, red shifts are interpreted as evidence of motion. If a light source is emitting light and moves away from you, then the light coming toward you will be red shifted. The wavelengths, <clears throat> pardon me, it'll shift toward the red end of the spectrum. Conversely, if the light source moves toward you, the light will be blue shifted. So you can think of red shifted kind of as a light beam being stretched out, whereas blue shifting is the light beam uh, being compressed. So by looking at red shifts and blue shifts in the light, we can tell how things are moving. If something is red shifted, it's moving away from us. If something is blue shifted, it's moving toward us. And there are some objects, like the Andromeda Galaxy, for example, that are moving toward us, but all the ones that are blue shifted that are moving toward us are all close to us. On a larger scale, everything we see, everywhere in the cosmos, everything is red shifted. That means everything is moving away from us. So this is, in, in, this is actually the foundational discovery that underlies the Big Bang model. If you imagine that we are here in this second from the top um, plane, we're on one of these galaxies, let's say the, the blue one here. Everything is moving away from us. Every other galaxy is moving farther away. That means in the future, everything will be farther away from us, like the top plane there shows. Okay, now let's mentally run that movie backwards. If everything is moving away from us into the future, that means thinking back toward the past, everything used to be closer to us, right? Think back far enough in time, everything used to be at the same place. And that's the fundamental idea behind the Big Bang model. The universe popped into existence as basically a point where everything was in that point and then it subsequently expanded and is still expanding today. So secular cosmologists will point to redshifts as being excellent evidence for the Big Bang having happened. They'll also tell you that the Big Bang accounts very well for the ratio of light elements in the cosmos. And lastly, they will point out that there was this discovery of the cosmic microwave background, which was actually predicted by the Big Bang model and then found, thus confirming that indeed this is a good scientific model, that indeed this is actually what happened. Now this is a sky map of the CMB, cosmic microwave background, showing the temperature differences across the sky. And sky maps, uh, if you're not familiar with how this works, here's this little animation. We're uh, supposedly in this galaxy. This isn't really what the Milky Way looks like, but whatever. So we're in this galaxy, and from our perspective, of course, we just see the inside of it. Now, if you imagine everything we see can be projected into this sphere surrounding the Earth, if you unwrap that sphere, that gives you then a sky map where you can show where everything is. So this sky map of the CMB shows us that there's actually radiation, microwave radiation, coming to Earth from all directions in space at a very low temperature. 
And as I mentioned, the Big Bang model predicted this, and so when it was found, this was considered to be confirmation and proof of the Big Bang. So these are the primary pieces of evidence for the Big Bang then. Red shifted light, light element abundance, and the CMB. You'll be told that these prove that the Big Bang model is true, that the Big Bang actually happened. Reality is a bit different though. Turns out these lines of evidence are actually consistent with other cosmogonies, other histories of the cosmos as well. So if they're consistent with other histories of the universe, that means they don't prove that the Big Bang version of history actually happened then, right? And by the way, the more we've learned about some of these evidence, uh, lines of evidence, the less consistent they're starting to look with the Big Bang model anyway, especially the CMB. As we've gotten more and more precise measurements of it, it's causing some real challenges and real problems for secular modelers. But anyway, these are the three lines of evidence that a secular cosmologist would tell you about if you were to ask about the Big Bang. There's other things, though, that he would rather not tell you about, like the fact that the Big Bang model isn't consistent with the actual universe we live in, in some very important ways. Why is that? Well, that's because our universe operates according to physics. But the Big Bang model doesn't work well with physics. The Big Bang model actually violates physics in some important ways. Let's talk about those briefly. For example, the Big Bang says in the beginning, before the universe was, there was nothing. And then it exploded. <laughs> How can nothing explode? Well, nothing can explode and did explode. That's why there's everything rather than nothing. Or so we will be told. But does this really work? Can you actually go from nothing to everything? No, because nothing can create what? Nothing. Nothing can do nothing. From nothing, nothing comes. As R.C. Sproul once said, if there was ever once truly nothing, there could never be anything. And as Dr. Phil Fernandez once said, you can't tell me nothing made everything. I know too much about nothing. <laughs> so. Now, sometimes people will say, well, yeah, but the, the Big Bang, okay, it looks pretty bad, but if you wait long enough, even something that is extremely improbable will eventually occur. Well, no, that doesn't work here. The Big Bang, something coming from nothing is not improbable, it's impossible. It doesn't matter how long you wait, that which is impossible will never happen. Nor does it work in this case anyway, because the Big Bang supposedly made four things, matter, energy, space, and time. There was no time before the Big Bang happened, according to the model itself. That means you can't wait long enough for the Big Bang to happen because there was no time within which to wait. <laughs> Nor was there a place to wait anyway. <laughs> now, if you take a physics class, one of the first things you'll be taught is a principle called the conservation of matter and energy. The total combined amount of matter and energy in the universe is conserved. It can never change. This is sometimes called the first law of thermodynamics. So you can shift the relative abundances of each back and forth, but you can't change the combined amount meaning you can't create anything from nothing, because that would violate this principle. What do I mean by shifting things back and forth? Well, uh, physics now understands matter and energy to, to be equivalent in some ways, different forms of the same underlying thing, in a way. You may have heard of the equation E equals mc squared. The E stands for energy, the M stands for mass, the amount of physical stuff, the matter that you have, and the C is a speed of light, which is a very large number. So that means a little bit of stuff contains a lot of energy. And we can shift those things back and forth. We can convert one to the other. For example, we can convert a little bit of stuff into a lot of energy. The most efficient way we know how to do that is a nuclear explosion. Again, a small amount of matter converts into a large amount of energy. We can go the other direction and convert a lot of energy into a little bit of stuff. We do that in particle accelerators. We get little chunks of matter zipping around at close to the speed of light and smash them together. More material comes out of those collisions than went in. And I don't just mean the number of particles, I mean the amount of matter there. Now, are we creating matter out of nothing? No. We're converting the particle's kinetic energy, it's their energy of motion. We're converting that energy into matter. We're not creating matter. So we can convert matter to energy and energy to matter, but we can never create either one, because that would violate physics. And we use this principle in our lives every day, actually. I mean, think about it. Why do you need to eat food every day? Regardless of how difficult that process might sometimes be. Because your body needs energy, can't make it from nothing because that would violate physics, so you need to get it from the chemical energy stored in the food. Of course, you have to get it in your mouth first, but that's a different story. Why do you get a bill from the power company every month? Because your appliances need energy to run, can't create it from nothing because that would violate physics, so you need to get it from the power company, which also can't create it from nothing because that would violate physics. 
So it needs to get it from the chemical energy stored in coal or the gravitational potential energy stored in flowing water or solar energy from the sun, which also can't make it from nothing because that would violate physics. The sun has to convert hydrogen and helium into energy and on and on it goes. So this principle is very fundamental to physics and to the world around us. In fact, you couldn't be watching this presentation here this morning if this principle weren't true because some of the principles of circuit design are based on this principle. Now think about it, this is baked into physics at the most foundational level. If you ever take a physics class and solve a homework problem or a test problem or whatever in such a way that it violates this principle, your answer is automatically wrong. But the Big Bang, if you think about it, it violates this principle on the largest possible scale, doesn't it? It says all the matter and energy in the entire universe popped into existence out of nothing. Are secular cosmologists aware of this? Yes. And some of them will tell you that they have it solved. They said, yeah, it seems like a problem that everything came from nothing, but that's actually not a problem because everything is nothing. <laughs> they will tell you that on a net basis, the universe contains no matter or energy. The total matter and energy of the universe are zero. Does this explanation work? Well, no, it doesn't. Uh, I'm mentioning it here only to point out that I am aware of it. Uh, if anybody wants details about why this explanation doesn't actually work, you can come talk to me afterward, but I'm sure most people don't care. <laughs> so other cosmologists say, okay, yeah, everything coming from nothing, that doesn't work. So in the beginning, there wasn't nothing. In the beginning, there was a vacuum. There was a vacuum of space. Well, has that solved the problem? Is a vacuum of space nothing? Well, no. It's something as I'll share in just a moment. Well then, where did the vacuum of space come from? Where, if it came from nothing, then you have a different form of the same problem, right? Something came from nothing. As this author, this secular cosmologist points out, a more fundamental problem is that this scenario, this empty space scenario, does not really explain the origin of the universe. A quantum fluctuation occurring in the vacuum assumes that there was a vacuum of some pre-existing space. And we now know that vacuum is very different from nothing. Vacuum, or empty space, has energy and tension. It can bend and warp. So it is unquestionably something. So you haven't solved the problem by invoking a vacuum of space because now you have to explain where the vacuum of space came from. Here's a quote from Alan Guth, who's a rock star among cosmologists, by the way. He invented inflationary theory. He says, from the point of view of general relativity, empty space is unambiguously something. According to general relativity, space is not a passive background, but instead a flexible medium that can bend, twist, and flex. A proposal that the universe was, was created from empty space seems no more fundamental than a proposal that the universe was spawned by a piece of rubber. It might be true, but one would still want to ask where the piece of rubber came from. So you see the problem. Some, uh, everything couldn't have come from nothing. Okay, no problem, they say. Everything came from empty space. Well, where did the empty space come from? Because empty space is something also. So you still have to have something coming from nothing at some point. Not to be deterred, some cosmologists will say they have solved even this problem. For example, Lawrence Krauss in his book, A Universe from Nothing, says he can explain this. Now, by the way, if you bought a book with the title, A Universe from Nothing, what would you expect the book to explain? <laughs> how, the, how the universe came from nothing. The very first thing he does in his book is talk about the fact that his definition of nothing is different than most people's definition of nothing. <laughs> that he wants to have empty space with a quantum field in it as his nothing, and that's where the universe came from. The only point in the book where he really addresses the question of where did the empty space with the, with the field come from is this part right here, where he says a quantum theory of gravity allows for the creation, albeit perhaps momentarily, of space itself where none existed before. So he admits, yes, it's a problem. We have to explain where the empty space came from that the universe was supposedly spawned within. But he says no problem because a quantum theory of gravity explains how even space itself can form from truly nothing. There's only one problem with this explanation. Physics doesn't actually have a quantum theory of gravity. Physicists have been working on this for a long time. It's a famous problem, and possible solutions have all failed. Does Dr. Krauss know that there's no actual, actual thing as a quantum theory of gravity today? Yes, he does, because as he admitted in an interview, I also don't have a quantum theory of gravity, so I can't tell you for certain how space comes into existence. But somehow he forgot to mention that part in his best-selling book. Very interesting. So we've seen something can have come from nothing, and if you want to say everything came from empty space, that's the same problem because empty space is still something. Where did that something come from? So the only way out of this is the third option, which some cosmologists say, is that in the beginning there was an eternal vacuum of space. There has always been something. 
So we thus avoid the problem of everything coming from nothing because there never was nothing. There's always been something. Well, that avoids the problem with the first law of thermodynamics, but it introduces a new one with the second law of thermodynamics, which is also very fundamental to physics. An explanation I like to use here is coffee, coffee cup cosmology. I call it. So if you take a cup of hot coffee and put it on the counter and you don't drink it and no one else does, what does it do? It cools off. Why does it cool off? Because there's a higher concentration of heat energy in the cup relative to its environment, the room. So a concentration of heat is always going to dissipate. So the heat flows out of the cup, heats up the room slightly, the coffee cools off to meet it, and eventually everything is at the same temperature. So if you walk into a room and you see a cup of hot coffee on the counter, how long has that cup been there? Long time or short time? Short time, because there hasn't been enough time for it to cool off, right? Can it have been there for an eternity? No. So you can use the hot cup of coffee as a clock in a sense. It won't tell you exactly how long it's been there, but you know it hasn't been there for very long. We can apply the same line of reasoning to the universe. Can the universe have always been there? No. Why not? Because we see things that are still hot within it. Our stars are very hot objects in the midst of very cold space. Over time, they're cooling off. They're going to burn all their energy. Some will explode. Some will just burn out. But every star you see has a finite lifetime. Stars cannot have been there forever. Now, some people would say, well, new, new ones can form. Well, there's problems with that issue, but let's set that aside. Star formation itself would also require energy, though. And the available energy to do that is also limited. So over a long enough period of time, all stars will be gone and no new ones can form. That means that we, since we still see stars today, the universe cannot be infinitely old. Because if it were infinitely old, if it, did ha if it had no beginning and has been here eternally, everything would have cooled off long ago, an infinite amount of time ago. So the second law of thermodynamics tells us that the universe can't be eternal. And by extension, that same reasoning, all of reality can't be eternal either. So the atheist model builder has a real problem here. He has to pick which part of fundamental physics he wants to violate. The first law of, of, of thermodynamics says the universe cannot have had a beginning, therefore it must be eternal. The second law of thermodynamics says it can't be eternal, therefore it must have had a beginning. The only way out of this trap is to say there's a supernatural creator outside of the laws of physics who made all this. That's the only thing consistent with physics. Every other atheistic cosmogony that's out there is going to violate physics in one way or another. Big Bang has a lot of other problems besides these. For example, uh, the Big Bang predicts that the universe will be filled with magnetic monopoles, little magnetic particles with one magnetic pole, north or south, but not both. The universe should be full of these things. They've been looking for 50 years and haven't found one. Now, this alone is a fatal problem for the Big Bang, by the way. This is a serious enough problem to show that the, mo the Big Bang didn't happen. Big Bang also has something called the horizon problem where opposite sides of the universe are at the same temperature, but the Big Bang says they can't be that way. Flatness problem is another issue for the Big Bang, where the universe should have massive ge uh, geometric curvature in one direction or another, but the universe doesn't have that either. Now, cosmologists try to solve all this with a process called inflation, where the universe expanded massively much faster than the speed of light, by the way, early in its history. Why would the universe do that? Well, they ascribe this to a process called inflation. The problem is this inflationary process is outside of physics. It's driven by a particle called the inflaton. At least that's what the models say. But has anybody ever seen an inflaton? No. Is there any room within particle physics for an inflaton? No. Is there any reason for believing in the inflaton other than the fact that if it didn't exist, the Big Bang model would be disproved by the evidence? No. So here's a process that's outside of physics that is also being discredited by the latest data, by the way. As this author points out, uh, mid, in the middle of that quote there, these uh, new data create a new difficulty that we call the inflationary unlikeliness problem. That is, the necessary inflaton potentials, the favor pot potentials, are exponentially unlikely, according to the logic of the paradigm itself. Interesting, too, that this particular uh, highlight of these problems, one of the authors is one of the original authors of inflationary theory itself, who is now rejecting the theory that he helped create. So we have a process that is outside of known physics, there's no room for it within physics, and exponentially unlikely according to its own logic. What do we call such a thing? We call that a miracle. <laughs> so to try to solve some problems with their model, secular cosmologists are invoking, in effect, a miracle. 
Other issues. The universe looks very well fine-tuned. In fact, entire books have been written about this. Now, I have a whole presentation just on this one topic alone. We could talk about the Earth, the Sun, the Moon even. We could talk about the properties of atoms, constants within physics, all sorts of things. But for now, I'll just focus on the universe as a whole. It turns out that the universe as a whole had, is, has extreme amounts of fine-tuning in it. For example, a few years back, some secular cosmologists got together and decided to calculate how finely tuned the Big Bang model had to be to produce the universe that we see. Turns out that if, there were, if the Big Bang had made, now the Big Bang couldn't actually make anything, but they believe it, it could. If the Big Bang had made a little bit of extra matter in the very beginning of history, there would have been runaway gravitational collapse, and things would be very different. If it had made less matter in the very beginning, there would have been runaway expansion. Turns out that the, the, the Big Bang had to be finely tuned to within one out of 10 to the 60th power. That's almost 60 zeros after it. Now, how do we capture such a thing? Well, there's about 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe, and if the Big Bang had to be finely tuned to 10 to the 60th power, it turns out the precision of the Big Bang had to be only 10 to the 20th atoms. That's about the same amount of matter as a single grain of sand. These Cosmologists realized and calculated that if the Big Bang had made one extra grain of sand anywhere in the universe, there would have been runaway gravitational collapse early in the universe's history, everything would be in black holes, we wouldn't be here looking at it all. Conversely, if it had made one grain of sand less anywhere in the universe, there would have been runaway expansion. Galaxies couldn't have formed, planets couldn't have formed, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. So this random event that happened without a creator or a fine tuner had to be finely tuned to a single grain of sand across the entire universe. Then, then the problem got worse. <laughs> now the fine tuning is up to 10 to the 123rd power. That's one out of this number. As this author says, third line from the bottom, example, we need to tune the dark energy to about 123 decimal places to make habitable galaxies in their secular model. Again, 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe, finely tuned now to 10 to the 123rd. Now we're down to fine tuning less than a grain of sand. We're down to fine tuning less than an atom within a grain of sand. We're down to this fraction of an atom, which expressed numerically is this. That fraction of the mass energy of a single atom is how finely tuned this random event that happened without a creator had to be. As this very secular physicist said, this is a cataclysm for physicists, or for secular physicists at least. And the only way they know, uh, that we know how to make sense of it is through the reviled and despised anthropic principle, <laughs> which is the idea that the universe had to somehow form so that man could live here. And that implies that we're sort of special, doesn't it? which he doesn't like, the implications of that. Now, if you ask a secular cosmologist about this, they'll say, yes, everything looks extremely fine-tuned. The universe looks ridiculously fine-tuned, but that's actually not a problem. We have an explanation for that. See, there's actually an infinite number of universes out there. And in an infinite number of universes, even the most unlikely one will be out there somewhere. We just happen to live in such an unlikely universe. This idea is now called the multiverse, multiple universes. Now, you may be wondering, wait a minute, how can there be more than one universe? The universe is everything. Well, they've redefined the word. The universe is now that part of reality we can ever perceive, even with the best possible telescopes and so on. All these other universes are, by definition, outside of our ability to see them, ever. And indeed, the Big Bang model is now understood to produce an infinite number of bubble universes. They're just popping into existence eternally, and they have been doing so eternally. Think about the implications of this, though. If there's an infinite number of universes out there, then everything that can happen has already happened and is happening and will happen again an infinite number of times. As this article says, is there another copy of you reading this article? A person living on a planet called Earth with misty mountains, fertile fields, and sprawling cities in a solar system with eight other planets. The life of this person has been identical to yours in every respect. You probably find this idea strange and implausible. What do you think? Yet it looks like we'll just have to live with it, since the simplest and most popular cosmological model today predicts that this person, your other alter ego, actually exists in a faraway galaxy. Your alter ego is simply a prediction of the so-called concordance model of cosmology. If space is infinite and the distribution of matter is sufficiently uniform, then even the most unlikely events must take place somewhere. In particular, there are infinitely many other inhabited planets, including not just one, but infinitely many other people with the same appearance, name, and memories as you. There is an infinite number of 
universes out there where we're having the same talk right now. There's an infinite number where everything is the same as this universe, but you had something different for breakfast this morning. There's an infinite number where the South won the Civil War. There's an infinite number where there never was a Civil War because the 13 colonies lost the revolution against King George III. On and on it goes. Any possible history you can think of is out there an infinite number of times. Now, this is a very popular idea today. But what's the issue with it? By definition, what are all these other universes? What characteristic do they share? They're all unobservable to us. They're outside of the world we can observe. They're outside of the natural world. What word did we apply to something outside the natural world? Supernatural. So supernatural explanations are allowed as long as the God of the Bible isn't involved. So you see what's going on here. Skipping ahead a little bit. Last thing I'll talk about, the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. Now, if the Big Bang were actually a good scientific model, it should have good scientific fruits. If it's a bad scientific model, then its fruits will not be good. So we can look at some of the fruits of Big Bang thinking and see what it says. For example, this author says, maybe we should approach cosmic fine-tuning, not as a problem, but as a clue. Perhaps it's evidence that we somehow endow the universe with certain features by the mere act of observation. It's an idea that Stephen Hawking has been thinking about, too. Hawking advocates what he calls top-down cosmology, in which observers are creating the universe and its entire history right now, just by looking at it. If we, in some sense, create the universe, then of course it's not surprising that the universe is well-suited to us. So you create the universe just by looking at it. So of course it'll be finely tuned, because what other kind of universe would you create? Now, that's an amazing story, but is it science? No, that's just science fiction. Other authors are trying to get rid of the beginning, because that sounds an awful lot like Genesis, by talking about baby universes fluctuating into existence continually, but half of them have a direction of time reversed with that in the others. In other words, half the universes have time flowing backwards. That's science? No, that's just science fiction. Another author pointed out some of the implications of exploring other planets and this multiverse. Now, he wasn't talking about the multiverse specifically here, but the same logic applies. He said, you know, if we explore other planets, we're going to run into planets where life evolved just like it is on Earth, and including dinosaurs. But dinosaurs got wiped out by a freak collision on Earth. They wouldn't have necessarily done so elsewhere. So he points out such life forms could well be advanced versions of dinosaurs. If mammals didn't have the good fortune to have them wiped out by a natural collision, we'd be better off not meeting them. That's true, because there's nothing worse than running into a dinosaur with better weapons than you have. <laughs> right? But if the multiverse is real, this is real. An infinite number of places. Look out! Here comes another one. I got it. Other authors have pointed out other implications of this as my time comes to a close here. This author says it's proposed that our universe was created by life of superior intelligence in another physical universe. Aliens and other universes might have such good technology to be able to create universes. That's why physics looks so finely tuned. Not because God did it, but because aliens and other universes did it. Is this science? Oh, wait a minute. If aliens could get such good technology, then no doubt there's universes out there where aliens could actually simulate universes. Maybe we live in a simulation then. Anybody heard this? As this author said, it's a perfectly acceptable supposition that the world as we know it is a vast computer program. Run machines built by an intelligence we know nothing about. If you accept the multiverse idea, it is almost inevitable that there are computer-based universes out there. Somewhere among the universes, there were, in all probability, be universes where civilizations had developed far enough to produce a matrix-style universe. Chances are, we do live in a computer simulation of a universe. So you thought you live in a real cosmos, on a real planet called Earth, in a real solar system, and all the rest of it, but no. You're actually living in a video game being played by some aliens somewhere. <laughs> now, you may think this sounds silly, but no, there's people looking into this. This study is trying to figure out if we live in a numerical simulation. Who would pay for such research? You are. Tax dollars are going toward this. But wait, there's more. If aliens could simulate universes, they can also simulate universes that contain aliens who are simulating universes. As this author seriously suggests, this is not a joke, there could even be multiple levels of simulation. The computer our universe runs on could be itself a simulation on another computer. 
So not merely are we living in a video game being played by some alien somewhere, those aliens are themselves living inside a video game being played by some alien somewhere. But why stop there? Because maybe those aliens are themselves living in a video game being play, who live in a video game being played by some aliens who live in a video game and, well, you get the idea by now. <laughs> now, is this science? It's not even science fiction anymore. This is just complete absurdity. But this is the logical fruits of multiverse thinking. This is where the model leads you to. So why? Why are cosmologists, scientists, intelligent men and women, why are they promoting a model that ultimately leads to such absurdity? Here's why. If there's only one universe, you might have to have a fine tuner. If you don't want God, you'd better have a multiverse. The Bible says the fool says in his heart that there is no God. Now again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not calling these people stupid. Very intelligent men and women. But the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you build a model to deny the fear of the Lord as, as its fundamental assumption, you're denying wisdom. Wherever, it else, whatever, wherever else it is you wind up must be, therefore, foolishness. And that's exactly where secular cosmology and secular origins overall has arrived to. So hopefully it's clear by now, this is not a battle of religion versus science. It's not that they have the science and the facts and we have blind faith in a book. Science is on our side. The problem is the culture is not portraying these issues correctly. My time has run to a close. My overall point is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The universe does not look like the product of the Big Bang. All these claims about secular origins are false. Science is on our side because the heavens declare the glory of God. I have some resources available in the exhibit hall. Uh, the talk you just heard was excerpted a little bit from this one, going through all the planets in the solar system, and two other DVDs as well. A lot of the, the latter material in this talk came from this DVD right here. My website is creationastronomy.com. There's a free email newsletter there available to you, and DVDs are also available there to you if you don't pick them up here. And that brings my time to a close. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks.